Let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 22. We're going to be looking at verses 47 through 53 as we continue our verse-by-verse study here in the Gospel of Luke. Let's begin reading together at verse 47. I'll read to verse 53 and get into our study. Luke writes, While he was still speaking, behold, a multitude. And he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, Permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come to him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. And so what we have here is Jesus Christ as he's there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And while he's there in that garden, he's already been instructing his disciples. And we saw that in our study last time we were together. We saw that he had been instructing them. Notice verse 40, how he had said to them, I pray that you may not enter into temptation. And then again in verse 46, why do you sleep? Rise and pray lest you enter into temptation. Jesus had been instructing them and had encouraged them, he even commanded them to be watchful and prayerful because being watchful and prayerful is the, uh, is the way that they're going to be able to avoid entering into sin. He was prepared for what was about to take place, but obviously his disciples were not. Jesus is speaking to his men, and as he's speaking to his men, he's in a location that Judas is familiar with. It's a place that Jesus went to often, even, even as it had said in verse 39, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed. And so Judas was familiar with this particular place that Jesus is, and that points something out to us. It points out that, that Jesus wasn't trying to hide. He went to a place where Judas could easily find him. And so Judas does. Now, Judas enters in. Remember with me that Jesus had left eight men at the entrance, had proceeded further on in with three of the men, then proceeded by himself a little bit further. And so remember with me that Jesus has left these eight men behind and all. Judas has entered into the garden, and obviously he has walked past the eight men who had been stationed there in a way to be uh, lookouts or to be able to bring a warning, and uh, he's walked right past them. So it gives to us uh, some insight that his disciples did not suspect him of anything. And here comes Judas as he walks in, and he passes by these eight disciples. But it's mentioned here that he came, notice verse 47, with a multitude. It says, as he was, or while he was still speaking, a multitude. And so Judas has come, but he's come with a multitude. Now, how do we know where he found this multitude? Where did these people come from? All you need to do is just cross-reference this particular portion here in Luke chapter 22 with Matthew's gospel as well as John's gospel, and you get your answer. It speaks of a great multitude, and this great multitude comes from basically two sources. One, it comes from the priests. Because according to Matthew 26, verse 47, Matthew says that it was a great multitude with swords and clubs who came from the chief priests and elders of the people. And so, one, you have people who have come from the chief priests and the elders. These would be the temple officers. And then secondly, John chapter 18, verse 3, speaks of a detachment of troops that were made up of Roman soldiers as well as temple police. Now, when he said in John 18, 3, it was a detachment, that word detachment is what we call a cohort. A cohort is a, a group of soldiers numbering anywhere from 200 to 1,000. So, it tells us that there's a great amount of people. That's why Luke refers to it as a multitude. There's a great amount of people who are entering into this small garden area with the intent of taking the Lord Jesus Christ captive. Now, they come in and they're armed. Matthew had said that they had swords and clubs. They're armed. And they're armed because they're fearing that the people following Jesus are going to riot. 
Matthew told us in chapter 1, verse 46, that when they had sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. And so they came well armed because they don't know what to expect. And they know that it's possible that there could be a small riot on their hands. And so what's going on is very, very, uh, there are a lot of things going on. And what I want to do is I want to set up for, for us to see what's happening. And I'm going to combine a couple of other gospel accounts so that we can see what's taking place here. Because notice with me, it says here in verse 47, one of the 12 went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. And Jesus is going to respond, verse 48, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And so I want to cross-reference this with Matthew's gospel, and, and I'm going to bring something out of Mark's gospel, and then I'm going to go to John's gospel. And so first I'll begin with Matthew. In Matthew chapter 28, verses, uh, rather 26, verses 48 through 50, in Matthew chapter 26, verses 48 through 50, Matthew says, His betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. Now, Matthew says that he came up and he kissed the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the reason he did that is because he wanted to point him out as the one that they were going to arrest. Sometimes when we think of Jesus, we may be thinking in terms of some of the religious imagery that we ascribe to him. You know, one of my friends, Gail Irwin, once pointed out that Judas uh, went up and kissed Jesus because Jesus was not a spectacular-looking man. He wasn't, he wasn't different than the others to such a degree that he would stand out. Uh, Gail has said, you know, he didn't glow in the dark, and that's pretty much the truth. Jesus was an average-looking Jewish man during the time of his ministry. And so there was nothing spectacular about him. There was no comeliness in him, Isaiah says, that we should desire him. He wasn't extremely striking. He wasn't somebody that stood spectacularly out of the crowd and all. And so what Judas has done is he's given them a sign. He said, listen, the one that I kiss, this is the one I want you to go and you can take him. In, in Mark 14, verse 44, uh, Mark says that, Judas had given them a token, saying, Whomever I shall kiss, that same is he. Take him and lead him away safely. Now, when he says in Mark 14, 44, take him away safely, um, it isn't that, that he's concerned about Jesus. He's saying take him away in such a way that it will prevent his escape. He was fully committed to betraying the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Judas comes up and he kisses him. It's dark. There are several other men in the garden. So it made identification easier. But when it speaks concerning the fact that he came and he kissed him, when it says in Mark 14, 44, as well as Matthew 26, when it says uh, that he kissed him, the fact is that this kiss that he gave to him was a, a gentle and it was a tender and it was an action that was repeated over and over again. The picture is that Judas actually came up to Jesus, walked up to him, hail rabbi, embraced him, and as he embraces him, you have to get the picture of this. This is what Mark wants us to see. He begins to smother his face with kisses. That's the kind of betrayal we're talking about here. It wasn't something that you would walk up. Some people have a custom of kissing you on a cheek. Some kiss on either cheek and both cheeks. And sometimes they kiss you three different times and all of that. It's not like that. It's the kind of kiss that a mom or a dad may give to their baby. It's that how, have you ever, if you're a parent or a grandparent, have you ever just smothered their faces with kisses? Well, I've done that. I do that all the time. My Sophie, I was with her today. You know, I'm with her every day. And, and as I was holding her, you know, I have a tendency as her grandfather of just kissing her little face. I'll talk to her and I'll just kiss her and I kiss her head. I just, man, I just love that baby. And so I'm constantly kissing all over her. I kiss her face all the time. Josiah, I'm the same way, my grandson. My boys, when they were growing up, my daughters, when they were growing up, I was constantly holding them, constantly kissing them. That's the picture that you have here. It's not just walking up with a formality. In some homes, you may walk in and you give them a kiss of greeting. My home's that way. Hello, we kiss each other a lot. It's almost a formality in some ways. That's not what this was. This was tender, this was gentle, and this was repeated. 
And so that's the kind of kiss that Judas is giving to the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. He literally is smothering Jesus' face with a kiss, with kisses. And so that's why Jesus looks at him in verse 48 and, and says to him, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? You know, the Bible in Proverbs 27, verse 6 says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Judas has used a sign of love and friendship. And in using that, it has become an emblem of betrayal. Now, John gives us greater insight, and I want to turn to John's gospel. Would you please turn with me to John chapter 18 for a moment? I want to give you some more insight into what's taking place here by taking you to John chapter 18 and looking at verses uh, 4 through 9. I want to develop this with you. And I thank God that we have actually four Gospels so that we can take each one of the pictures given and we can put it together and get a completer picture, a more complete picture. And you get that in verse 4 through 9 here in John chapter 18 because John writes, Jesus therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now, when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. And then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I've told you that I am he. And therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which was spoken of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Now, as I read this, and I've read this over the years so many times, I always get the same picture here. As I read this, I almost find it humorous in a certain way. I mean, they come walking in, and you have to remember that they're blustering. There are over 200 of them who have entered into a small garden. There aren't a lot of people here to, to resist them. You have to picture that. If you were part of a crowd of 200, at least 200, up to 1,000, but at least 200 people, if you were part of a crowd of 200 people, armed guards, temple police, you enter into this small garden, you're approaching a single individual, Jesus, a rabbi from Nazareth, and you approach him, there has to be some kind of mentality that you have that you are, you are going to terrify him. You have to have this attitude that I've got 200 people behind me, you know, we are, we, we are obviously able to overpower you, so there's got to be this sense of intimidation, there's got to be this sense of, of kind of a bluster that's going on, a bravado of some sort. I mean, 200 people have entered into a small garden to take a man who's only got 11 people with them. You've got to have this sense of being almost like the baddest thing on the face of the earth, and so when you walk in, Jesus doesn't run. Jesus isn't hiding. You don't see them chasing him through the garden while he's climbing an olive tree to try and get away. What you see is they walk in, and Jesus, and I want you to see this, Jesus walked towards them. In verse 4, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them. So they didn't even have an opportunity to hunt him down. He hunted them down. He confronted them, one man against the 200 military personnel. And that's what Jesus does. He walks in front of his men, and he stands in a way to protect them, and he asks them, whom are you seeking? Well, they speak to him, and so they say, Jesus of Nazareth. They don't recognize him. That's the reason Judas is going to come up in a moment and kiss his face. They don't recognize him. And so, because they don't recognize him, Jesus speaks to them and says, who are you looking for? They say, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And then Jesus responds, I am he. Now, Judas, who betrayed him, stood with them. Now, when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now, imagine that for a moment. Who are you looking for? We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. You can almost see the guys as they're hitting one another or acting all bad and this and that. Jesus says, I am he. And immediately they take a step back and they're all on the ground. And this is where the humor comes in. He asks them again, whom are you seeking? This time he's looking down on the ground. Now, to me, that's kind of a funny picture, I have to tell you the truth. Because he's looking down. Who are, you, who are you guys looking for? And they're looking up at him now. <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, this gives us an insight into the fact that were he not allowing them to take him, there's no way they could have. Were he not allowing them to take him, 
They could not have taken him by force. Jesus, as he's there standing there with all of his majesty, is not afraid at all. He actually confronts them. Now, as this is taking place, it reveals a couple of things to us that I want you to see. One, this reveals that Jesus was not a martyr. Jesus was not a martyr. He chose to die. This is something he chose to do. They didn't come and take him by force. He yielded himself. He wasn't a martyr. Now, the New Testament witnesses that to us. Titus chapter 2, verse 14, when Paul was writing to Titus, he said that Jesus gave himself for us. When Paul was writing to the Galatians in chapter 1, verse 4, Paul said to them, Jesus gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age. Jesus was not a martyr. Jesus was a willing sacrifice. They did not come and take him uh, in a way that was not within the sphere of his will. He yielded himself. He approached them. He confronted them. He asked them, whom are you seeking? And so, one, it tells me that Jesus was not an unwilling sacrifice. He yielded himself. And then, two, and notice what it says here when he begins to speak in verse 8, and he says, I've told you that I'm he, therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. The second thing I see about this is he has a protective love for for his sheep. Jesus was willing to lay his life down, but he protected those who belonged to him. That's what he says in John chapter 10, verse 15, I lay down my life for my sheep. And so, one, we see that he's not a martyr. He's a willing sacrifice. And two, we see that he cares so much that he actually steps in between those who are taking him and his sheep, and he says, if you seek me, let them go their way. And so, Jesus Christ is acting out that point. Now, in verse 5, I want you to see again, Judas has made a final decision. Notice how it simply says, Judas stood with them. When it came down to it, and when it comes down to it, we have to make a choice who we are going to stand with. Am I going to be standing with the Lord, or do I stand with those who oppose him? I have to make that decision. Am I on his side, or am I on his enemy's side? I have to make that decision. In, in Luke chapter 16, verse 13, we read, No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is earthly wealth. You cannot serve God and materialism. You cannot serve two masters. You need to make a choice. Which one are you going to be totally loyal to? And, and so Judas made his decision even as you and I have made ours. When I committed my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, I made a decision. The decision I made was to be loyal to him no matter what for the rest of my life. That was my decision. When I asked Christ to come into my life, I weighed that out. I, I had heard the gospel more than once. I had been taken on one occasion to Calvary Chapel as a 20-year-old as and had entered in and, and had uh, heard the message of the gospel spoken clearly. I knew what the demands were. I'd heard the demands made. I had a guy witness to me on the beach. I had another person share with me at a tasty freeze. My friends who had gotten saved had been speaking to me concerning Jesus Christ and, and, and his claims on, on my life. And, and so I'd heard the gospel. I had begun hearing the message of the gospel. And I, I knew that the Lord Jesus Christ called for a, a total commitment. I knew that. And, and that's the reason why, uh, a large portion of the reason why I, I didn't really want to, to, to to yield myself to those claims. I, I, I frankly wanted to convince, my, convince myself for some time that I already was a Christian, but the reality is, is I was now beginning to hear a message that went contrary to the things that I had felt that I trusted and believed in. And so the thing that was a great concern was the knowledge that if I were to yield myself to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, that you cannot lie to God. You're not to swear an oath falsely to God. I, I knew that if I said yes to him, that it was forever. I knew that. See, I knew that because I was raised in a, a religious denomination that, that properly taught me that, uh, that an oath to God was to be kept. That's one of the reasons why, you know, oaths are big things to me. That's why when, when Marie, my wife, and I got married, that's one of the reasons why when, when that pastor was, was conducting that, that ceremony, that uh, wedding ceremony, 
when he was speaking to me, and, uh, and he is saying, do you promise to love her and cherish her and, and all of that? Till death do you part. Man, that was heavy. Because as I was there, there were three girls in the audience that I could have been dating. It's the truth. Marie knows this. I'm not lying. Three of them. And I'm looking at them. And I'm thinking, this is for keeps. Death, man, that's heavy. I'll never date another girl in my life. I'll never, I don't know. And I said, yes, of course, of course. I want to be with this girl the rest of my life. And I made an oath. But I made the oath to God in front of witnesses. So oaths mean an awful lot to me. Even when I got saved, I knew, and so did you, I think, that when you said yes to Jesus, you were saying yes to him and no to everything else. I was saying yes to Jesus and no to every other religious persuasion, every other religious faith on the face of the earth. I was saying to God, I will not serve or try to serve two masters. I will cling to you and hold fast to you the rest of my life. That's how you get saved. I've heard guys give invitations where they'll say, give God a try, give God a chance. <laughs> you don't give God a try. You don't give him a chance. You give God everything. You say, all of you and none of me. I am not going to try to serve two masters. I will have but one, and I will be loyal to you to the best of my ability with your power until you come and take me home. And that's what's taking place here. Judas made a decision. He chose who he wanted to stand with. He stood with the enemies of Christ. He stood with the enemies of Christ. We have to ask ourselves, who are we standing with? Who is my master? Who is the one that I take orders from? Because it's either God or it's some other source. And Jesus made it very clear, you can't serve two. You can only serve the one. Now, when you serve the Lord, he blesses you. But Jesus is the one who told us the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. One of the things I've tried to emphasize over the years on various occasions is, is I try to emphasize the fact that God loves you and Satan hates you. He doesn't just dislike you or dislike the fact that there are Christians. Satan hates you. He wants to destroy you. If God didn't have a protective barrier around you by the Holy Spirit who is there to protect and be with you, he would tear you apart the way that a lion would rip up a lamb. He would tear you apart and destroy you, with, and he tries. But the Lord doesn't allow him to do that, does he? He doesn't allow him. The wicked one touches you not. Why? Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And so the Lord has a protective barrier around you. But if you were to remove that, the enemy would tear you apart. You need to understand that today. And when people make a choice, they should choose to stand with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Judas made a choice. And he chose to stand with those who were Jesus' enemy. And so as we turn on back to Luke chapter 22, we have Judas there. And Judas is betraying the Lord Jesus Christ. Betrayal. Betrayal is so very difficult. And it's very difficult to emotionally recover from. When someone betrays you, it's especially painful in the Christian life. People who get saved very often, many of them don't trust others easily. And then they get saved. And then they start saying things to the Lord like, God, help me to love, help me to trust, help me to care, help me to have compassion, Lord. Help me to be out of the, the shell that I have been living in and help me to break out and be somebody that actually reflects you. Some of us are not 
naturally outgoing people. I have many people in this church who are, and I love you to pieces because I, I love people like that. My wife, Marie, tells me she's shy. That's, that's just not true at all. My brother told me when, when I began dating, he said, if you're going to ask her out, I need to tell you one thing. You better not be jealous because if you're a jealous man, you shouldn't take her out. He says, because that girl has friends everywhere. And it's the truth. I took her out one time, and she goes walking up to two guys. You know, it's our, our second date. She walks up to two guys. Hi, you know, how are you? And I'm just standing there looking at them, you know, just like I feel kind of odd. I don't know who you are, and this woman does apparently. And they're looking at her, and that was Marie. And she's still that way, but she tells me she's shy. You know, she's a person who just didn't. You know, me, I'm one of these people who's pretty much to myself. I'm, I'm that way, and, 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 I, and I'm reserved, and I have no problem with that. Some people think that I'm supposed to be, you know, a little different than I am, but the fact is that's who I am. I'm a shy and I'm a reserved person, and the only time I come alive is when I stand behind this pulpit. You know, they kind of wheel me out, and I, I do this, and then they wheel me back in, you know. It's, <laughs> that's about it. So I can tell you that, that some people do not have an easy kind of attitude when it comes to trusting people. Some of you are that way. It's difficult to trust people. And uh, when you finally do, when you finally allow people to get close to you, well, that's a big thing. And then when they break your trust, it can be very difficult to recover from because it was difficult for you to trust them in the first place. And now that you have, they haven't honored your trust. Now, to be honest with you, as a Christian, I don't expect the world to necessarily be trustworthy. As a matter of fact, I expect those who don't know the Lord to be very capable of betraying a person's trust because the world's out for itself. But... As a Christian, I expect more from a Christian brother. I expect more from a Christian sister, a friend in the Lord. And when they do something that breaks my trust, it's a very difficult thing to go through. All of us understand that. The psalmist in Psalm 41 verse 9 said it this way. He said, even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. A man that I sat down with and ate meals together with. Guys that I would hang around with, and if you bring it up to 21st century, you know, people that I'd go to Star Starbucks with and, and drink some coffee and hang around and visit and talk about the family and sports and, 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 and my religious faith, people that I would invite to my house that, that I would, would serve a meal to, my familiar friends, somebody that's very close to me, somebody that's very dear to me, somebody that I would, I would look at as being like a best friend, my familiar friend lifted up his heel against me. That's a prophecy relating to Judas and how Judas betrayed Christ. The psalmist in Psalm 55, verses 12 through 14, said it like this. He said, it's not an enemy who reproaches me, and then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide from him. But it was you, a man, my equal, my companion and my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together, walked to the house of God in the throne. It was you. It was my dear friend. Listen, I expect an enemy to hate me. I, I don't have a problem with that because I know that. I, I know there, there are people who, who, who want to exalt themselves over me. I have no problem with that too. I understand that. So I am wary of them. I'm aware of them in the sense that, that I, I just don't, I don't trust them. I, I don't trust them enough to allow them to have the position and power in my life to hurt me, and, and they can't. It's you, my best friend. It's you. The person I used to go to church with, we walked together in the throng as we went to worship God together. And this is what Judas did. 
Judas goes to the enemies of Christ and he makes a deal. And he says, listen, what will you give me if I betray him to you? We'll give you 30 pieces of silver. Done. I'll find an appropriate time, the right opportunity, and I'll lead you to him in such a way that you can take him without any problem. Judas, knowing that Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, it's his regular practice when he's in Jerusalem, goes and gets a detachment, temple police, Romans, a couple hundred or more show up in this garden. Judas in the front leading them, walks up to the eight who are there by the gate. They see Judas, not aware of what he's doing more than likely. He walks past them, enters in. The others follow him. Jesus is there and he sees him. As he's walking towards Jesus, Jesus walks towards them. Whom are you looking for? We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. That's me. If you're looking for me, let these go. Judas now walks up and starts smothering Jesus' face with kisses, making it a confirmation. This is exactly who it is. And all of this is the kiss of betrayal, the betrayer's kiss. Judas betrays the Lord. Not only does Judas betray him, but later on, his own disciples are going to flee and forsake him. And you would think that in those circumstances, being betrayed by a friend, being left by those who were closest to you, that that would be something that would break Jesus' heart. It's interesting how in John chapter 16, verse 32, though, Jesus was praying, or actually was speaking, he said, Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and leave me alone. But he goes on to say, And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Listen, one of the things that I want to give to you, because I know there are some in this room who have been betrayed and perhaps are even going through pain over that to this day, One of the things I want to give to you about that is this. You're never alone. You're never alone. You're not in it by yourself. God is with you. There's a beautiful scripture, Psalm 56, verse 8, where the psalmist said, You number my wanderings, put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? Put my tears into your bottle. God, in other words, is pictured as having a container of remembrance of the tears that you have cried. The pain that some people have suffered. The loss of a friendship. The pain of seeing a prodigal child who at one time had been the model child that the little one who used to come to Sunday school, the one who used to memorize the Scripture, the one who used to to talk to people about Jesus Christ, the one that that seemed to be called by God and, and something happened to him in high school, something happened to him in college. And the faith that they used to have, the faith that you were so proud of, has been lost. And you're praying for them and you're hurt. And they at one time used to be seated next to you in church, and now they mock your faith, and, and it hurts. Or you went up to that altar, you went up to that aisle, and you made your vows to God with that person, the husband or that wife, and they promised before witnesses that they would love you forever, they would tenderly cherish you and never leave you nor forsake you. They said, my God will be your God. Wherever you go, I will go. My people, your people, they're going to be the same people. They made those promises. And then one day they came in and they said, I don't love you anymore. And they betrayed your trust. And some of us in this room have cried ourselves to sleep more than once because of the pain, because of the disappointment and hurt, because of the sorrow of heart that we've experienced. 
And God says, listen, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You're never alone. I'm with you. And I have to tell you, in my own spiritual life, there have been the ups and there have been the downs. There's been the valleys and there's been the hills. And a lot of my life, my early days of walking with Christ were in valleys. Maybe that's why I pastored Chino Valley, I don't know. Been a lot of valleys. But I know that you pass through the valleys. You don't remain there. And you're never alone. Like the, like the psalmist said, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You're with me every step of the way. You never leave me. You prepare a meal, a banquet before my enemies. You, you are in control of everything, and you bless my life. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And you, you, you learn to cling to those promises in the still moments where you're feeling such pain. God doesn't forsake you. God is with you. He has promised, I will never, never, never leave you nor forsake you. And, and though Jesus would say, I am alone, he went on to say, yet I am not alone, for you are with me. And I encourage you today, I really do, I encourage you to come to understand the depth of that, what that means. Because, like I said, there have been many moments in my life where God has taken me deeper into that one sense that, listen, it feels like I'm by myself right now. It feels like nobody understands me. It feels like nobody cares to understand me. But, Lord, you do. I learned that a long time ago, that getting married doesn't mean that your wife or husband will understand you. As a matter of fact, most of the time they don't. That's what makes marriage fun. They don't understand you half the time, and the time that they do understand you, they're mad at you. So what do you get? I mean, but there's one who does understand me. That's why sometimes when I pray, and I'm sure I'm speaking to some who understand this, that's why sometimes when I've prayed, I don't even have to go into long and lengthy prayers. I simply will say, Lord, you know. You know. I can't even go into all the words. The words escape me, Lord. You know. Even as Paul in, to the Romans in chapter 8 says that there are times that the Spirit makes intercession with groanings that cannot be uttered. There are times in, in my life that I've simply just groaned out to the Lord because there were no words that I could use to express the feelings that I were having at that moment. And yet in the midst of all of that, there's this knowledge that, that the, though there's a sense of betrayal, there's a sense of pain, there's a sense of rejection, there's a sorrow of heart that is probably beyond anything. I, there have been times when I've, I've said, Lord, you've got to do something because I can't take any more than this. I can't take any more than this. Lord, you have to deliver me. Do you understand what I mean? How many of you do? I think some of you do. I can't take more than this. This is much. I've reached, I've reached, I've reached it. <laughs> I can't take more than this. And the Lord is there to bring comfort, never alone, even when you have been betrayed by those whom you love the most, even when your dreams have exploded in front of you and they're just residue and just smoke and noise, a flash and pain. And then you just look up, dazed, and you say, but I'm not alone. You're with me. Well, that's what's taking place. And so what happens? Well, Jesus approaches him in verse 48 here in Luke chapter 22. And Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. <laughs> But Jesus answered and said, Permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Now, as you see this is taking place, Jesus is standing there. The disciples are watching Jesus as he approaches and, and has seen these people fall before him and there's like a tangled mess. 
So at that moment, I suspect that the disciples kind of figured that there's nothing to be afraid of. And so immediately, you want us to strike with a sword? Now remember a little earlier in in chapter 22 at verse 36, Jesus had said, "Uh, he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. And so what happens is they have a sword And so one of them, according to verse 50, uh, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Now, we know who that was, don't we? That was Simon Peter. Simon Peter was the guy who did that. Mr. Impetuous. Now, I find it interesting. I want you to see this for just a moment with me. Because when it says uh, in verse 50 that they struck the servant of the high priest, John tells us who it was. It was a man by the name of Malchus. You see it in John 8, 18, verses 10 and 11. It says, Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Uh, the servant's name was, was Malchus. Well, what's taking place? Well, this is, again, interesting. During the time of Christ, it was preferred to use your right hand over your left. Even to this day, in certain societies, the right hand is used for certain things and the left hand is used for certain things. And so it was proper to use the right hand. And so during that time, the Apostle Peter would have been one who used the sword with his right hand. Now, if Malchus were facing the Apostle Peter and Peter has the sword in his right hand and he takes the swing in order to connect, if Malchus is facing him and he's using his right hand, which ear is going to get cut off? The left ear. So that tells me that Peter hit him from behind. What kind of bravery is that? There's a head, boom, you know. I had a friend who used to do that. If you weren't looking at him, he'd hit you. If you looked at him, he wasn't that brave. So that's what happens. He takes his sword, there's a handy head, and he takes a swipe at it. It's a good thing he's a fisherman and not a swordsman, though it would have been an interesting healing if Jesus would have picked up a head and put it back on. Now, that would have been rather cool. (laughs) In this way, he, he gets his ear, and the ear is just hanging there. And so Jesus ministers. Look what it says here. He touched his ear and he healed him. Now, now that, you know, that's an amazing thing. Now, Jesus is speaking. When he says in verse 51, he says, permit even this, and he touches his ear. The point Jesus is making is, my kingdom's not of this world. I haven't taught you to live this way. Matthew tells us in chapter 26, verses 52 and 53, that Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? In other words, if I needed help, I could have 72,000 angels at my disposal. And and Peter, I don't need your help. It's like a flea trying to protect a Rottweiler. It's not necessary. I don't have to help God. He isn't looking for backup. And and that's what's taking place here. In Deuteronomy 20, verse 4, the Scripture says, the Lord your God is, is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Peter, you don't need to to, to take up the sword and do battles for God. You don't have to do that. God can take care of himself. You see, Peter's impulsive act could give the impression that, that Jesus led a band of angry men. So in order to remedy his misrepresentation of the kingdom, Jesus heals this man's ear. And in doing so, it reveals once again that he came to heal and not to destroy. I think sometimes we are better known by the world, more known by the world of the things we were against instead of the things that we're for. And one of the things that we need to remind the world of and through our actions that, that we, are, we are for the Lord and, and we love him and, and we pray that God gives us love for, for people. And so Jesus is, is showing that he's here to heal and not destroy. Now, what's interesting is, and, and I, I would note this with you, none of the Gospels ever say what happened to Malchus other than this healing. But for the rest of his life, Malchus carried with him the memory 
of the touch of Jesus Christ for the rest of his life. I mean, I'm certain that I have people in here who have wounded yourself in the way that your body has gone into shock. I have. I lifted my toenail up one time on my big toe. I hit a, a board, and it lifted my toenail straight up, straight up. And all this sand got inside, and I had to go to the emergency hospital, and they had to dab that out with a cotton swab. I know pain. <laughs> it is my friend. I hate it. I'm acquainted with him. I jumped off a wall on a stick when I was eight years old. I know pain. And you remember certain things. And with this man, his ear was cut off. The blood must have just caked on his neck. And the shock and the burning sensation must have instantly hit his body. And as he's there, Jesus is ministering. Put away your sword. And he reaches and he touches Malchus's ear. Instantly it's healed. And Malchus has had a touch from the Lord. And undoubtedly he went home later on and washed off the blood from his clothing and looked at his ear and his ear is completely healed. Now, if Jesus had a sense of humor, he might have turned the ear around and said, ah, yeah. <laughs> nobody will ever sneak up on you again. I'd have done that. That's why I'm not Jesus. <laughs> but he heals him, and he goes home, and undoubtedly there's evidence, the touch of Christ. But we're never told if Malchus ever came to faith in Christ through that. You know, there are people that can be touched by the Lord in a variety of ways who never do come to him, and they know it. They know that God intervened. They know that God did something on their behalf. And we never find out what took place with Malchus. Interesting, isn't it? And so in verse 52, Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come to him, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? <laughs> when I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Calmly, majestically, Jesus confronts those who take him. He rebukes them for their cowardice, and he rebukes them for their ignorance. They are afraid of him. He has supernatural powers they cannot withstand. They know his works. But Jesus is saying, I know, I know that you know that I am not evil. You know that I am not violent. You know that I am not a murderer. And yet you have sent armed soldiers to take me. I was with you daily. You are working under the cover of physical and spiritual darkness. You don't have the courage to arrest me during the day because you're afraid. Instead of being an upholder of righteousness, you are being used to do evil. That's what he's saying here when he speaks about it being your hour and the power of darkness. The fact is, God allows this to take place that he might fulfill his plan of salvation because that's the reason he had come in the first place. In John 12, 27 and 28, he said, Now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. For this purpose I came to this hour. Glorify yourself, Lord. I have glorified myself, and in the resurrection, I will glorify myself again because Lord Jesus Christ came that he might yield himself up. They did not take him. He went with them. Judas betrayed him, but Jesus was never alone. His disciples forsook him and fled, but Jesus walked with his Father all the way to that cross so that he could overcome the enemy so he could give us victory through his resurrection and he could transform our lives. I don't want to be like Malchus and I don't want to be like Judas. I want to be a faithful disciple who knows the touch of the Lord and remains faithful to him.